Yes! Hey everyone, and welcome to the final episode of The Completionist of 2015. Star Wars The Force Awakens is here. What an iconic day and joyous occasion. A moment that we can all experience once more. Seeing a Star Wars movie in theaters, let alone seeing a brand new one for that matter. I thought I would celebrate today by completing one of the more notoriously difficult Star Wars games of children's past. Super Star Wars. Now, sure, there may have been plenty of officially licensed Star Wars video games dating all the way back to the early 80s, but 1992 Super Star Wars was an attempt at creating something truly special. The vast majority of the early Star Wars games left a lot to be desired from both their gameplay and their faithfulness to the source material. But, according to Kalani Straker, Super Star Wars' lead designer and director, it was created to be much more than its predecessors. With gameplay designed to rival the likes of Contra and Castlevania, and graphics inspired by games like Street Fighter 2 and F-Zero, Super Star Wars was aiming to compete with the best of the best on the Super Nintendo. And with its utilization of the Super Nintendo's impressive Mode 7 graphics, it was primed to do just that. With a development that possessed respect for both video games as well as the Star Wars franchise, Super Star Wars was set to show just what it could do on a home console. It's fondly remembered by many for being their first playable Star Wars experience and hated by many more for being harder than Imperial Walker armor. Having recently been re-released on the PlayStation Network and with the impending release of Star Wars The Force Awakens, now seemed like a best of time as any to check in on the classic known as Super Star Wars. Now, Star Wars is incredibly iconic, there is no doubt about it. So I'm not going to explain the plot of Episode 4, A New Hope, because you've had plenty of time to do that, people! Come on! So instead, I'm going to assume that you've seen Episode 4. And don't you worry, all your favorite characters are in this game. Luke, Chewie, Leia, Han, that guy, Star Wars. Beginning with a remarkably accurate recreation of Star Wars' opening crawl, Super Star Wars' story begins exactly as the movies does. Except that absolutely no time is spent showing or explaining the battle between the Imperial Cruiser and Princess Leia's ship. But hey, we can see the escape pod on its way down to Tatooine. Cut to Luke Skywalker, looking straight into the cameras if he's going to say, Oh, you ready for me already? Okay then. Here I go. I guess. Then Luke begins blasting his way through the Dune Sea. Like it's a normal day in his life of being a farm boy. You know, now that I think of it, we never really got much of Luke's everyday life before it gets flipped and turned upside down. Maybe just getting to and fro from the Tashi Station really was that much of a war zone. After battling the Dunes, we're treated to a scene that differs a bit from the film. Luke comes across the crash site of the droid's escape pod, as well as the stranded C-3PO. The protocol droid explains that his buddy R2-D2 has been captured by Jawas, and that the two of them have to go bust him out. You know, that might be just a little bit different than the movie is. But hey, it's all good. You gotta insert some action into your action video game somehow. But I'm guessing that things got back on track after that, falling right into the line with the plot of the movie. Wait, what was that? Luke goes on a killing spree on the Jawas' as Sandcrawler? Just on the word of some strange droid he met an hour ago? That seems pretty straightforward to the movie, alright. I guess we now know what the Super and Super Star Wars stands for. Super goddamn violent. <laughs> Super Star Wars does an admirable job of recreating scenes and events from the movie while also pushing the Super Nintendo's audio and graphical capabilities to their extremes. The sprite work is big, expressive, and fluid. Unlike a lot of the older Star Wars games, in Super Star Wars, when you're looking at a Stormtrooper, you know it's a Stormtrooper. Now, many of the enemies you encounter in this game may not be from the movie, but that's understandable. You can't just shoot Jawas and Sand People forever and be satisfied. You need some variety. Even if a lot of these baddies are unrecognizable, I'm glad they're around. 
Super Star Wars wowed players back in the day with its vehicle sequences. As in, wow, there's no way I'll be able to get past this stage and I don't know where to go. But also as in, wow, this looks incredible. You can thank the Mode 7 for that great parallax scrolling which gives the backgrounds in these sequences an imposing sense of scale and depth. But the biggest problem with the game's visuals is how bored you'll inevitably get with the game's Tatooine levels. Seriously, three-fourths of the game's levels take place on Tatooine. Sure, some of these stages are visually distinct, such as the Sandcrawler and most Eisley Cantina, but far too many stages feature drab desert environments. When you finally get to the Death Star levels, it almost feels as if you're playing a different game altogether. Super Star Wars' music is ripped straight from the movie A New Hope. Thanks to the Super Nintendo sound card, it's rich and layered too. The sound effects are just as impressive, which includes some spoken dialogue straight from the movie. There's something so special about the Jawas screaming, Houdini! Every time you blast one. Every single time. It'd be a little sad if it weren't so damn funny. The team behind Super Star Wars clearly paid attention to the little details that make a game like this feel authentic, like the use of the Star Wars font and the patented Star Wars wipes being utilized when you complete a level. The game sounds great, it looks great too. I just wish you didn't spend so much time in the damn sand. Too much sand. 7 out of 10, too much sand. Super Star Wars is a classic run-and-gun platformer with a twist of arcade inspiration. You know the drill, you make your way from the left side of the stage to the right while racking up points before fighting a boss at the end. Except with one difference, it's Star Wars. STAR WARS! Sorry, the movie's here now, I've probably seen it, you're all probably watching it right now instead of seeing this video. Sometimes I just can't help myself. At the start of the game, the only weapon you have at your disposal is a blaster, and with this thing, I can see why Han Solo was so attached to his. It can fire in just about any direction, including diagonals, and it's got infinite ammo. Go ham, young Skywalker. Go ham. You've also got a mid-air flip, good for increasing your height, and a slide that helps you too quickly get under obstacles. While Luke is the only selectable character available from the start, you'll eventually get to play as the baddest duo in the galaxy, Han Solo and Chewbacca. Han's got a roll move instead of a slide, and while Chewie has slower movement speed, he has higher health. All three characters share virtually identical mechanics, but it's nice to be able to pick which of your heroes you get to play with on any given level. You can upgrade your blaster by obtaining power-ups that are hidden throughout the game. They're placed in predetermined locations and are dropped by specific enemies once they're defeated, so they're kind of rare. But once you grab one, your blaster will move up one step in the ladder of deadliness. Your first upgrade will transform your default blaster into a flame blaster, and then into a homing missile, and then into a rapid ion shot, and finally, the plasma cannon. Each upgrade behaves pretty differently with some granting more damage, bigger hitboxes, and even the ability to ricochet off the walls. These power-ups will carry over in between stages, but if you die, you go all the way back to your basic out-of-the-box blaster. Luke eventually will get access to his lightsaber about halfway through the game. It may have shorter range and it does some good damage. More importantly, it makes you feel like a Jedi Knight. Don't worry, you can switch back to the blaster anytime you want. There are plenty of other items in Super Star Wars as well. Hearts will of course give you some life back, whereas these random lightsabers will increase your maximum health. Kind of weird, right? They couldn't have just chosen any other icon to represent more health. You can also collect Darth Vader helmets to grant yourself double points for a short time. And these weird discs that add a few seconds to your time limit. You've got shields, which make you temporarily invincible. And finally, if you need to blow up every single dude on the screen, then look no further than the thermal detonator. Yeah! Yeah, baby! Yeah! Burn! I'm sorry! Excitement? Adventure? A Jedi does not crave these things. But Super Star Wars isn't all about platforming. It also has a few levels that feature your character's vehicles blasting its way through enemy lines in order to reach its destination. You've got to shoot and kill a set amount of enemies before you can safely head towards your goal to the end of the mission. But the Jawas, Womp Rats, Rocks, and Pits aren't going to make it easy. Wait, those are Womp Rats? I did not get that at all. These missions may feature devices called land speeders, but you'll have to take it slow if you know what's good for you. Trying to bully your way past the enemies before killing them will result in a bad time. You'll just end up surrounded by Jawas who will pick you apart, undoubtedly seeking revenge for your massacring of their people. Remember, safety first before you hit that gas. Enemies in Super Star Wars pop into the screen and begin to harass you so fast that you have no choice but to run and gun. 
Individually, they're really pushovers, preferring pure numbers over having a lot of health. But certain enemies, like the wall-mounted flamethrowers and lasers, are sometimes a bit too hard to differentiate from the other background details. It's kind of infuriating to repeatedly get hit by something you thought was just decoration. The game includes some bosses that are definitely from the original films, like the Sarlacc Pit monster. But it'll also include some dudes that may or may not be actual Star Wars characters. I'm gonna ruin this one, but like the Kalhar boss monster, who I recognize as one of the pieces from Chewie's chest set aboard the Millennium Falcon. Let the Wookiee win. And the Imperial Defense Droid, who just seems like a generic Ed 209 ripoff. And then there's the boss of the Sandcrawler stage, known as the Lava Beast Giantco. Dude, who is this guy? He looks dope! His name kinda sounds like Jawa. Is he somehow related to the Jawas themselves? Is he some kind of mature form of Jawa that only one of them evolves into each generation? Like a queen bee or something? For all I know, all of these guys have rich backstories in the extended universe. Former extended universe, can we have a moment of silence and remembrance for the now non-canon Star Wars expanded universe? Rest in peace, homies. When it comes down to their roles as bosses, these guys range from painstaking bullet sponges to virtually invulnerable tanks with no discernible weak spots. Of course, every boss does have a weak spot, but it sometimes becomes a bit tedious waiting for them to expose their delicate parts. It should be said that while Super Star Wars plays well and can be lots of fun, it's also really f hard. With its constant barrage of enemies and your blaster being savagely nerfed upon death, not even the Force can save you from the many nicks and cuts you'll receive as you play. I put this on the Jedi setting, which is the hardest mode. And to give you an idea, I practiced this game for hours and hours and hours. First on easy, then on normal, and then on Jedi. I needed to literally become a Jedi Master before I recorded in order to get this episode done. The game may be pretty liberal with its hearts and power-ups, but most of the time, it's not enough to keep you alive. Better start practicing communing with the Force, or whatever the hell Qui-Gon Jinn said to become a ghost. I hope you've seen A New Hope, cause it's about to get spoiled, son. After reclaiming R2-D2 and hooking up with Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke and company jump into the Millennium Falcon with Han and Chewie to rescue Princess Leia from the Death Star. They bust her out, Ben gets got, and they fly to Yavin. Yavin, Yavin, and they fly to Yavin. Secret Death Star's plan, weakness in its design, X-Wings, let's go! All cut up? Good! The final fight begins with you taking control of Luke Skywalker as he pilots his X-Wing along the Death Star's surface. Now this stage shares many mechanics with previous vehicle stages and also features those pretty Mode 7 visuals, but by this time around, you can't really back up to take careful aim at your targets. In order to eliminate all 20 TIE Fighters and all 20 Towers, you'll have to keep making laps until you've destroyed all of them. Once you do this, you'll transition into an impressive looking first person mode of the final trench run. Now that you're in the cockpit of your X-Wing, you have to stay alive long enough to deliver the final payload to the Death Star's weak spot. It's really hard to, but you can kill some of the TIE Fighters assaulting you. More importantly, you can shoot down the blast they send your way. With only about 10 hit points in this portion, it's all about survival from here on out. If you survive long enough, Darth Vader will confront you in his TIE Fighter Advance X-1. He may technically be the final boss of the game, but he's honestly a pushover. You'll have to spam your attack until he decides to call it quits. If you get rid of him before your time runs out, you'll then have a clear shot at your target. But make sure you line up your shot, because if you miss, you'll have to start the final level all over again. If you rely on the power of the force instead of your eyes, then you'll succeed in hitting the mark. Actually, no, use your eyes. Don't use the force. You're playing a game, come on. Once the Death Star goes kablooey, you'll be treated to a recreation of the metal scene from the end of A New Hope. The game explains that your efforts have caused the Empire to retreat from that part of the galaxy, but then warns you that the Empire might strike back. Very cute game, very cute. There is no completion bonus in Super Star Wars. The game does have a hard mode known as Jedi Mode, but playing through that honestly is an exercise in chaos. Hell, normal mode is hard enough. The game does feature some codes such as stage skip, invincibility, and even a debug menu. So if that sounds like your jam, or if you just need a little bit of help passing normal mode, then be sure to look them up. But other than that, you absolutely get nothing for being a critical part of the Rebellion's victory over the Empire. Man, now I know what Chewie must have felt like. You'll get your medal one day, buddy. One day. Maybe in episode seven?
There's a lot of fun to be had with Super Star Wars as long as you've got two things, a love of the franchise and patience. While shooting feels pretty smooth, the jumping feels a little bit stiff, which really makes things difficult in an already tough platformer. Upgrading your blaster makes things way easier, but once you die, it can be quite a long time before it reclaims its former status. And the novelty of being able to play through A New Hope wears off pretty quickly when you're stuck on Tatooine for the majority of the game. Playing on easy mode might just be the best way to experience this game, since normal mode is still rifled with examples of old, laborious game design. And Jedi mode is really a nightmare. With that being said, if you can handle what this game throws at you, then it'll be a real treat, especially if you're in the mood to revisit a classic. Super Star Wars is full of faithful and accurate recreations of your favorite Star Wars moments, but unless you're damn good at video games, you may never actually get to see any of them. The graphics and sound design are awesome, but the difficulty can be cruelly unforgiving. It's also not a very deep game, but games of this style aren't really meant to be so, so I'll let it slide. With that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Go see episode seven before the internet ruins it for you. But before you do that, be sure to subscribe. Also, if you're looking for more Star Wars videos, show some love to Pro Jared, who recently did a video on Shadows of the Empire. And if you missed last week's video, check it out right here. That's all the time we've got for today, guys. So please, as always, let us know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. Don't forget, I'm still streaming Xenoblade Chronicles every single day, uh, Monday through Friday, for the next three to five months. Today would mark, uh, what, the sixth day we've been doing this. It's been going really well. We have 50 codes of Xenoblade to give away. I've already given away, what, three or four of those codes. I've got some codes for Shovel Knight. I've got so much more. I'm going to be also buying a 3DS with Xenoblade Chronicles out of my own pocket to give to you guys. I'm not getting paid for the for the stream. Everyone thinks I'm getting paid. I am not. Uh, Nintendo just gave me the games to give away. I'm just doing it for you guys to get free stuff. So we have a lot of stuff to give away. Come check it out. It's going to be a long journey, but I'm learning. And with your guys' patience and guidance, I will get there. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to watch Star Wars Episode 7 for like the next six days. Power overwhelmed.